the people the light of the world but they rather just stay in the dark stay in the dark I warn them day and night about the beast, but they still end up taking the mark. Everywhere I go, they're falling away and it's breaking my heart. Grace and peace in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, Yeshua the Messiah. To the elect across the earth, we love y'all so much. Welcome back to the dinner table. I'm so excited to have you. Are you hungry? Did you? You better have come with an appetite. That's all I'm going to say. Amen. And if you're new to the channel, you're probably wondering, what is this man talking about? Well, it's very simple, okay? All through the Bible, Jesus Christ tells us that he is the bread. Last time I checked, you eat bread. The word of God is the bread of life. We eat the word. Amen. In fact, Throughout the Bible, you hear Jesus say things like, eat my flesh, drink my blood. He says, I stand at the door and I knock. If you let me in, I will enter in and talk and have dinner with you. Can I get an amen? Okay. I mean, Revelation says, we will, Lord willing, be at the marriage supper of the Lamb. The word of God says, taste and see that the Lord is good. Shall I continue? I mean, come on, we got to get to the message. But I just wanted to explain to some of y'all that are new why we call this the dinner table. Amen. And of course, I'm your waiter. Isn't that cool? So Jesus is the one who cooks the meal. I'm the one who serves you the meal. I'm your waiter. You see what I'm saying? But you see, he has many titles. You know, he got so many titles, even more titles than we even know. Think about this. John, the gospel of John says that there's not enough books on the planet, on the earth, that can contain everything that Jesus Christ uh, said and done. So with that being said, imagine the titles that we don't know about, right? He's the Lion of Judah. He's the Living Water. He's the Bread of Life. He's the Alpha and Omega. You see, he's not just the Lord of Lords. He's not just the king of kings he's the chef of all chefs can i get a name man he's the king of the kitchen amen and as the servant of the lord as your waiter you definitely gonna need a plate can i get an amen wait right there don't you go nowhere Uh, what you know about the Lord is my shepherd dinner plate. Let me just go ahead and slide that on to you. Slide that. <laughs> my fault. Slide that over to you. I ain't going to slide it on to you, okay? Slide that over to you. Uh, there you go. Put your word right on that. Now, I know this going to sound crazy. Do you mind if I eat with you? I know that's kind of crazy, right, for the... For the waiter to ask to eat with the person that they serving. But I'm going to eat with you. You see what I'm saying? So I'm going to go ahead and put my plate down. I put one of these blessed Bibles on top of there like that. Now, of course, hold on. Don't be, don't be reaching for the food already. You know you got to wash your hands. You know your mommy ain't raised you like that. You better stop. <laughs> so to wash our hands means we pray. Amen. We get washed under the blood. So we come before the Lord clean and pure. All right, now. Come on. Let's get it. Say it with me. Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, son of the living God. Forgive me of all sins known and unknown and wash me in your holy blood, mind, body, soul, and spirit. I forgive my enemies. I renounce all of the kingdom of Satan. I renounce all of the occult. Lord Jesus, I ask you to renew the spirit of my mind and cause me to focus and not be distracted. May I humble myself and hear the word of the Lord and not fight against the truth nor your servant. May I receive your word and walk in it. May your word be a light unto my feet, health to my bones, to correct me, convict me, encourage me. Faith comes by the hearing of the word of the Lord. How can they hear unless one preach? Thank you, Lord, for this word, and I give you the glory in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 
And Lord Jesus, as your servant, speak through me. May your word be alive, a rima, to touch the hearers, to change them. In Jesus Christ's name, for your glory, I give you all the glory. Amen. Hey, listen, this one right here, some of y'all flesh is going to try to make you walk away and shut the video down and please stay, okay? This is a very, very important message. And uh, I hope you got your pen. I hope you got some paper now. Come on. And of course, you, you better have your word with you, okay? And have an appetite, because we about to get our grub on today. Um, we got a lot of messages coming out by the grace of God. A couple of quick announcements before we begin on this life-changing, convicting, yet encouraging message. Um, number one. Uh, for anyone that's been trying to become a part of the ministry, you went to the website, you went into the partner, you send it, you sent your info, make sure you put your email correct, double check it, okay? And check all mail in your email, whether it's Yahoo or Gmail or whatever, because you know the enemy is slick with it. He'll try to put our response in the spam box or somewhere in advertisements or some weird spot on your email and you thinking we didn't get back to you. If for some reason it's not in those places, it's not us. We're not like pushing you to the side. The reality is we're not pushing you aside on purpose. You need to let us know. Hit us up with another email. Okay, we love you. Also, a lot of y'all been asking me to re-upload the Can You Handle the Truth? Listen, that video is on the website revelationsofjesuschrist.com. That is our official website, okay? We're going to be doing a lot more activity there. We're going to upload a lot more videos there. Can you handle the truth? We had to upload it uh, through another company because YouTube obviously shut it down. It's very interesting though, right? YouTube shuts down the video and now there are mainstream websites, uh, news websites that are trying to say, oh no, we're debunking all the theories online, there's no microchip, there's no DNA altering vaccine, they gotta massage the people to sleep just like I told you they would. But you have to do your own research, period. But the word of God says my people perish because of a lack of knowledge. You going to believe those lunatics? <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy. So, yes, a couple of announcements, a couple of disclaimers. We love y'all so much. Be on the lookout. The uh, street outreach uh, ministering 101 video, Crying in the Wilderness, is already working. We're putting it together. Um, it's going to be a series. We don't know if it's going to be one big video or spread out to multiple videos. It, we have to disciple. We have to train up people to be disciples and to grow and mature into the calling that they have been called forth by the Lord. Okay, we need leaders to step up and take charge and help others grow in the gospel. So this is a very important series you don't want to miss. With all that being said, it's time. Are y'all ready for the message? I want you to write this down. Returning to the vomit. Write that down. Returning to the vomit. I do got to give another disclaimer. If you see me just get up and walk away, if you're new to the channel, it's something that a lot of us do called the walk away. A lot of brothers and sisters walk away with me because the word hit them too. And they just, they get overwhelmed just like me. Sometimes you'll see me walk away just because the word gets so strong. The revelations get so amazing uh, that sometimes I just need to take a walk. Walk over by the kitchen sink and take a breather real quick. <laughs> so if you see me walk away, don't worry. Your brother's coming back. Can I get it? And amen. Have we fist bumped? I just, I'm just curious. We at the dinner table in Christ. We are family. I, ain't, I apologize. I ain't even asked how you been lately. What's going on at home? How's your mother? You know what I mean? How's the little ones? How's your spouse? You know what I mean? Can we fist bump real quick? Ah, that's what I'm talking. Now we ready. You see what I'm saying? I apologize. I was not supposed to lean over your plate. That is a very rude thing for a waiter to do. Forgive a brother, okay? Returning to the vomit. 
this is such an important message because there's a strong principality that is causing many people to be lukewarm, to go back and uh, to, to become a backslider or backslide the spirit of Laodicea. And we just want to run through the scriptures. I want to show you some revelations. And we're going to do a strong prayer by the grace of God. And I want to show you a video clip. You have to watch it. That's going to be the deal. Okay. When I tell you this clip, when I'm saying, hey, I'm about to show you this uh, compilation of uh, certain things. You cannot turn away from it. You have to watch it. Some of y'all are going to be like, man of God, why would you make me watch such a thing like that? You're going to see what when we get to it. But that's going to be the commitment that you have to watch it and you're going to know why when it's done. Okay. So returning to the vomit. Well, first off, what does it mean to backslide? What does that mean? Right. It means to fall off. Right. You ever heard of apostate or to be apostatized, right? To turn gradually from the faith. That's interesting because a lot of times men and women that follow after the Lord, a lot of them slowly start changing. They don't realize it at first. They don't, you know, they used to be on fire for the Lord and then the fire started going down. It started going down. It started going down. You remember that movie Castaway? Where the man crashes. He's the only one that survived on the island. And it took him so long to start a fire. But how amazing was it when that fire finally started? Can I get an amen? He was like, yo, fire! He was running around grabbing leaves. Anything he could grab to throw into that fire to keep the what? The fire going. Because he didn't work that hard to see the fire go out like that. Do you see what I'm saying? Now... Before I break down that analogy, I'm giving a disclaimer. Although there's no like um, fornication in that movie, I don't even believe there's curse words in that movie. Uh, but there is some really deep, um, hidden shots that they take at the the masses in that movie. Because you know Hollywood and those in high places, they're Luciferians. You know they're Satanists. They're part of the elite. For the loser. We we are elite in Christ. Amen. What does the word elite mean? There it is on the screen. Read it. Why are we calling them elite? You know what I'm saying? Like, give me that title back. Y'all ain't elite. Y'all corny. Y'all side with the loser who already fell like lightning. <laughs> Anyways, my point is. You notice how they mock all of us. Because those at the top compare all the people as cattle or goyim they call all, all of us right and they believe we're we'll worship anything we're pagans you know what i'm saying we're foolish we'll talk to a a volleyball right so there was a wilson i think it was either a volleyball or a soccer ball right and he's on this island a lot of y'all already seen the movie whatever but my point is is did any of you ever catch the hidden occult mockery in it, though? You notice that the ball did not become alive to the man on the island, which was Tom Hanks. And uh, he's a whole nother story, but it wasn't alive to him until he hit it with blood. And the blood made the face of Wilson. Remember, he was talking to Wilson. And every time Wilson would start to fade out, he'd have to cut his hand. And put blood on the ball and make the eyes again. He was making a blood sacrifice to a pagan idol, which was the ball. Which, you know, Baal, right? Which is a little difficult because, you know, if I'm out, I'm going to be like, hey, son, grab the soccer ball. You know, if I take the boys to the park or something. Or, you know, if, if I was having a great time in the Lord, I'm like, man, that was a, I had a ball in the presence of the Lord. So, it's tough because that word doesn't necessarily mean Baal. But... 
I see the symbolism there, right? So think about this logically. There was a blood sacrifice with his hand to create that ball into an idol, into something to talk to. And that's them mocking us that we'll talk to a, a soccer ball or a volleyball before we'll talk to the Almighty. Isn't that so sad? It's pathetic, but they're mocking. They're mocking the masses who have no clue. So now that I got that out of the way, let's get back to the analogy. So the fire was so excited for it was so exciting for him because it took him so long to make that fire my question is god has given you a fire and you were so excited when he blessed you some of y'all i you know if you were baptized in the holy ghost and fire i'm very slow saying that because most people I meet have not been baptized in the Holy Ghost and fire yet. They've received Jesus. They've received the Holy Spirit, but they haven't been filled with the Holy Ghost and fire yet. The rushing winds, all of that has to happen. Speaking in tongues, prophesying, these signs shall follow, right? But the reality is no matter what level of fire, have you maintained that level of fire or has it slowly been going out? Would you work so hard for that fire like the man on the island and when you finally get it started, you don't run around and add to that fire? You just sit there and watch the fire dim down and go out because fire is a consumer. Remember, Hebrews twelve twenty nine says, for our God is a consuming fire. God consumes. He's a consuming fire. That means you got to constantly feed the fire of God in your life. Oh, come on. Come on. Wow, I'm catching revelation. I Should I do it, Lord? Uh -uh, I'm not doing it. Let me. <laughs> that's a whole nother Bible study. Can I get a name? Man, a consuming fire. Mm, wow. Lord, that mercy. You are so good, Lord. Okay. I apologize. Don't get mad at it, brother. Okay, that's another study. So the point is, is are you allowing your fire to go out? In real life, you've seen it in that video, but in the spirit, you have a fire for the Lord and in the Lord. But it's your job to feed that fire. You know what? Lord, do you please, if I could, I'm just going to tell y'all the revelation God just dropped on me, okay? I was going to hold off and I was going to turn it into an entire different message. I might just do it and it's up to the Lord, really. But if God is a consuming fire, maybe the things that he tells you to get rid of and the things that he, you, he tells you to sacrifice is actually put into him as the fire. He burns it, but it actually keeps his fire grow. I'm about to do the walk away. Wow. Wow. I should have did the walk away. That is so strong. Some of y'all probably did the walk away. Wow. So if God is a consuming fire to keep God burning in our life, we have to feed the fire. Wood, leaves, and all of these things, just like a real fire in real life. But you ever wonder, what do you feed the fire? That, okay, okay, let's let's get off of that. So to backslide is to turn gradually away from the faith. And a lot of y'all know from the Boiling Frogs of Babylon video. And some people actually thought I was playing a video of a real frog boiling. Like, <laughs> lady, calm down. It was a fake frog at the end. They did not kill the frog and I didn't make the video. But the analogy was very helpful. Right? That they put this frog in a, a pot of water and they slowly boil the water to kill the frog. It's actually a fact. But the devil a lot of times will not just flood you all in one all at once to try to get you to become lukewarm. He will slowly try to attack a person. Do you see it? So a lot of times, and I was saying this to, uh, you know, a lot of our brothers and sisters that are on the Thursday night conference calls and shout out to the saints of the Lord in the fight with us. Y'all that faithfully get on the conference calls and your emails, your, your comments in the, in the comment section of the videos and your letters and 
We love y'all so much, man. Y'all are such a blessing. Y'all are growing. How fast you brothers and sisters are growing in the Lord and growing in this ministry from all over the country and the earth. And uh, we just want to let you know we love every single one of y'all so much. And we are just so humbled and so thankful to have you with us. Let's say it like this. This is a better ministry because y'all believers in Christ are in it with us. Y'all help make it a better ministry. Amen. But we wanted to say thank you uh, for being with us and, and by our side in this fight. We're running out of time. But why did I bring that up? On Thursday night, I was saying when I was talking about this message, how you can't check your own temperature, right? If I go like this, I'm going to be like, oh, yeah, I'm good. But if somebody has a sickness or, or like a fever, mom will come and put her hand or dad will come and put his hand on his child and they have a different body temperature that's normal. So they're actually able to check and be like, oh, child, you're, you're burning up. You're burning up. You got a fever. Boom, boom, boom. But the child will be like, what do you mean, mommy? I'm good. I'm not hot. Why? Because you can't check your own temperature with your hand because your body is the same temperature, right? Well, it's the same way in the spirit. You need leadership in your life. You need elders. You need teachers you need people that will hold you accountable and people that are not afraid to check your temperature like let me just let me uh, you know what i mean check your temperature and be like brother you've been changing something weird going on or what are you doing like you got some new friends in your life or something you're not the same believer i knew two years ago Sister, I'm checking your temperature in the spirit and you're, something's changing. You're not on fire for God like you used to. See, that right there is people that love you. And a lot of times, people of God that love you are the ones you feel offended with because they're telling you the truth. And a lot of times, truth is an offense. Ah. But, but ain't that the truth? For real? Keep it real. So you should, you should want leadership. Now, I'm not talking just anybody. They got to be qualified people of God, but you should want them to check your temperature. You should be willing. King David said, let the righteous slay me. He would rather a righteous man slay him. Paul said, have I become your enemy because I tell you the truth? So what is your temperature in the Lord right now? Are you on fire or are you cold? Or you look warm, right? And be honest. Don't just answer that. Okay, you want scriptures? We at the dinner table. It's time to eat. Can I get an amen? We're going to start off at Proverbs 14. Let's go to Proverbs 14 here. Let's get it. Proverbs 14, verse 14. The backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. And a good man shall be satisf satisfied from himself. See that? So a backslider in heart shall be filled with his own ways. Think about that logically. He's going to lead and direct his own steps. He or she is going to stumble and fall because of their own craftiness. You see what I'm saying? The Bible says there's a way to a man that seems right. Anywho... We're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 13 here. This is heavy right here. This is a good word. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name. And don't assume this ain't for you. Don't be... Uh, some of y'all are thinking of who to email or text message the link or put this on their social media. You're thinking... Oh, I got 10 people in mind that I want to send this to. Before you send it, before you send this to them, you watch it. Don't just assume you, you always on fire and you know what I mean? Let this word go into you to keep you. You might not be lukewarm today, but God forbid you don't know what the future holds. And this word can actually be a defense mechanism if the enemy was to try to take away, try to fight your fire for God. You see what I'm saying? Because a lot of people that are lukewarm and are backsliding think they're still cool with God. That's scary. 
That is scary. Because what happens is, okay, mm, should I do it? What happens is they confuse that they still are, have a gift or uh, anointing. And they think just because they're still walking in that gift or that anointing that God is still with them. That's not always the case. Okay? We're not going to get into that. It's another Bible study. But it, it, it gets heavy. It, it gets heavy. So here we are. 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Look at what it says in verse 5. Look at, what, look at what it says now in chapter uh, 13, verse 5. It says, examine yourselves. Ooh, no, 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 no. We can't do that. We got to read from verse 1. Look at this. Wow. Wow. It says, this is the third time I am coming to you in the mouth of two, three witnesses. Shall every word be established? I told you before and foretell you as if I were present the second time and being absent now. I write to them which herefore have sinned and to all other that if I come again, I will not spare. Since you seek a proof of Christ speaking in me, which you to, to you ward is not weak, but is mighty in you. For though he was crucified through weakness, yet he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we all live with him by the power of God towards you. This is it. Now listen, verse 5. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know you not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ in you, except you be reprobates. That's scary. A reprobate is somebody who God literally gives up on. He'll never give up on anybody. You don't read your Bible. But I want you to remember, Paul said, if I come again, I will not spare. In verse 2, he's talking about the rod. He's going to deal with them. Did you know that? Did you know that apostles, prophets, powerful Children of God who have been living holy and walking in the light have authority to bring punishment to people with God. Paul said he handed over Alexander and uh, what's his name? Diotrephes. No. Someone in there was two men who Paul actually handed over to Satan that they would learn not to blaspheme. That means he was in such a holy place in God. He had the authority to hand people over to Satan. And Satan was allowed to do things in their life. To, and it was really used as a footstool to cause the person to repent. It was in hopes that that person would realize, oh, God must be angry with me. There's too much. This, this is OD. This is what's going on here. Lord, I repent. It's to bring a man or a woman down to humble them. That's not for everybody. A person has to be in a certain place to bring a rod to a ministry, to a congregation, to leadership, or to people. But I'm telling you, there is a person, there are people that can get to a certain level of authority in Christ where they have that permission from God. Wow. But he said, he said examine yourself. To see whether you're in the faith or not. That means that some people who started off walking with the Lord fell out of the faith and didn't even realize it. He said, look, you better take your time and you better make sure you're in this. You'll know a tree by its fruit. Right? How are you living? How, what's your lang language like? Who are, you, who are the people around you? What kind of friends do you have? What do you watch? What do you listen to? What are your appetites? That should tell you. Whether you want fire or not, you can't lie to God and you definitely can't lie to yourself. You can deceive yourself, but at the end of the day, you know at some point if you're not being right or not. When somebody is utterly blinded, I get it, but you have to realize God knows whether someone is on fire or not. And no one can say at some point they didn't get some kind of conviction. And if they have no conviction at all, that's a bad sign. That means they're more than likely reprobate or on the road to reprobation. That's a whole nother sermon. Because if somebody continues to practice sin and practice sin and practice sin and live sinful 
over and over and over again. In between, they listen to sermons. In between, they watch these videos. In between, they, they you know what I'm saying? God is warning them. In between, they're reading certain verses that are recommended to them. But none of it is working. They just continue to live a nasty life. It's like spitting in the face of Christ. And eventually, God says, go to the bed with Jezebel. You want her that much? Here, I'll throw you on the bed with her. Did you know he says that in Revelation? Huh. You better know God. You better know the other side of God. Now, examine yourselves, right? Now, Jeremiah got a lot of them. We're not going to read all of them, but go to Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah chapter 2, just real quick. I want you to see this now. We're bringing it all together. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 19. Your own wickedness shall correct thee. And your backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore and see that it is an evil thing and bitter that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God. And that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord God of hosts. You see that? So the backsliding shall reprove you. Your own wickedness will correct you. What does that mean? Because when somebody who is serving the Lord starts walking away and starts going into the world and starts... Uh, being deceived by religious worldly people, religious Christians, excuse me, I'm burping already, religious Christians, oh man, a lot of times they are the worst because they will massage somebody to sleep and make them accept being worldly and say, oh no, God is love. You're, once you're saved, you, you know, you're eternally destined, you know what I mean? If God knew, he ordained you to be saved, you can't be unsaved and do it, you know what I mean? If you happen to smoke, if you try to quit, but if you can't quit, you're saved. You're on your fifth marriage? Hey, look, just repent every morning. You're saved. These people are so dangerous. So dangerous, right? But notice he says, notice he says here in verse 19 that they have forsaken the Lord thy God. And that his fear is not in them. One of the first things that Satan strikes at and tries to remove out of children of God is the fear of God. And that's why he'll try to gravitate people to listen to preachers and YouTubers that do not preach the fear of the Lord. And they actually fight against the fear of the Lord. And they'll try to accuse teachers like me to be fear mongers, always trying to, you know what I mean, make people afraid of God and... Are you serious? Do you know how many times the, the New Testament talks about the fear of God? Paul said, I preach the word of God with fear and trembling. The word of God in the New Testament says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Like, are you serious? So, you know, you have your own will. Whether you're going to allow people to deceive you or not. But write down these Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 12. Jeremiah chapter 3.22, Jeremiah uh, 8.5, and Jeremiah 14.7. Okay, you can read those on your own time. Let's go to Luke chapter 9 real quick. Luke chapter 9, hallelujah. You know, I look at this message to be like a very simple message, but it's super strong. It's a very strong message, and I'm just so grateful for this word. I don't know how long it'll be. I definitely don't believe it's going to be more than an hour and a half long. But um, check this out. So Luke chapter 9, verse 62. He said, And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hands on the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. You see that? You see that? You Listen, don't look back. Remember Lot's wife, the Bible says. Right? Don't look back. So on and on and on and on, the Lord warns us, doesn't he? Wow. I want you to write down Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1. Okay? But we're going to go to another verse, but let's just read it real quickly. Therefore, we ought to give the more earnest heed to to the things which are which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. 
For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of a reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him? Wow. You see this. So let's you know, this is not a game. You can't play with this, y'all. This ain't one of these play, play church ministries. We, we love the Lord. And we told you time and time again, this ministry is not for everybody. Although I would love it to be for everybody, it's not for everybody. I'm just keeping it real with you. If people are afraid of this, if they're afraid of the war to come, if they're afraid to... Uh, stand against the world and stand against the beast and the rise of the enemy. If they love the world, if they don't want to change, if they're not willing to commit to actually live what the Bible commands them how to live, they're going to walk out of this ministry. It is what it is. But those that love the Lord, those that are, those that are serious, those that are sincere, those who want to make it in, those who want to honor Christ and have crowns to lay at his feet, they're going to stay in this ministry. They're going to sometimes, man, there's words you're going to click on a video and it's going to be like you in a fiery furnace and you feel overwhelmed by the sword of the spirit cutting you up. But it's healthy for you. How could a doctor remove cancer out of a patient without cutting open that body? But you need it. You need to be corrected. You need to have the fear of the Lord, but it has to be balanced with the love of Jesus Christ. See, that's the balance right there. And everybody knows, especially those that have been in this ministry faithful for years will tell you this ministry is blessed by the Lord. The Holy Ghost is with them. They are sound in the word and they're very balanced. Thanks to Jesus Christ. See, we just submit to Christ. We, we, we confess that he is the head of the ministry. Why do you think I say I'm the servant? Why do you think I say I serve you the meal? Because he gets all the glory. But we're very blessed with balance in this ministry where we're going to show you the fear of the Lord, but we're also going to show you the mercy and the love of Christ. So you have that healthy balance. No different than a child's relationship with his father, right? His father is loving. His father will wrestle with him, slam him on the couch, tickle him, give him a nuggy. You know what I mean? But if he gets out of line, his father will spank him in love. He has that healthy balance. You see what I'm saying? But let's go now to Hebrews. Okay, we're going to go to chapter 6. This one is big. Okay, Hebrews chapter 6. Look at what it says now in verse 4 going down. Now listen to this. This is no joke. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened. You cannot be enlightened as a sinner living in sin. This is somebody that God has called them by their name and the light of Jesus Christ has opened up their understanding to know who Jesus is. You, there's no way around this. Listen to this. And have tasted of the heavenly gift. What do you mean tasted? We had the dinner table, right? And were made partakers of the Holy Ghost. Let me ask you a question. If somebody doesn't give their life to Jesus Christ, does God give them the Holy Ghost? I mean, think about this logically. Does God just kind of walk down the street, find some disgusting sinner, drunk? He, he abuses women. You know what I mean? He's got murders under his belt. And God says, here, have the Holy Ghost without him repenting, without him confessing his sins and giving his life to Jesus Christ. Does God do that? Or does God intercede and stop people on their road to Damascus like he did to Paul when he was Saul? You see that? Three days God was dealing with Paul. That's a great mystery. Paul then realized, wow, Jesus is real. Then God sends. See, Jesus sent the man of God to lay hands on Paul, to pray with Paul. And he received his sight and received the Holy Ghost. So there's no way around this. This is somebody who was saved, who was enlightened. They tasted of the gift. Partakers of the Holy Ghost. No Satanist, no New Ager, no lost person can be a partaker of the Holy Ghost. It has to be someone who comes to the enlightenment, enlightened, right? It says right there, 
and receive the revelation of who Jesus Christ is. If I have a small cheese pizza, let's come on, let's keep it real. A veggie pizza, at least, come on. Onions, peppers, a little bit of olives, you know what I'm saying? My wife, Linus, love the anchovies. Some of y'all ladies, look, I don't get down with the anchovy, okay? He needs to swim his butt over to the water and stay off my cheese pizza. <laughs> but listen, if I have a cheese pizza and I eat a slice and I give a slice to my wife, I give a slice to my two sons, I give a slice to a brother here, I give a slice to a sister here, and you don't reach for a slice, you don't ask for a slice, you don't even acknowledge the pizza. And we're all eating the pizza and there's one slice left and we want you to have it, but you don't acknowledge it, you don't see it, want to receive it. Can you say you are a partaker of the pizza? Can you leave the house, can you leave our house and be like, whoa, that was a good slice of pizza, man, whoa, I partook in that pizza, no. We gonna be like, you're lying. You did not partake in the pizza. It was right there. It was free. You know what I'm saying? You didn't eat the pizza. Therefore, you were not partaker of the pizza. So how can someone be a partaker of the Holy Ghost without receipt? I'm trying not to do the walk away. But I need to make it simplified so you can see it. So these liars who don't know the Bible don't try to trick you into some dumb stuff. Right? Now. So we we eaten now. We eating. We eating. Deuteronomy chapter eight. Deuteronomy. Come on. Let's get it. Come on now. Deuteronomy chapter eight. Let's go. Let's go. Hallelujah. Deuteronomy chapter eight. We're gonna go to verse eleven. Look at this. Wow. Beware that thou forget not the Lord thy God in not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I commanded thee this day. Wow. Lest when thou hast eaten and are full and hast built goodly houses and dwelt therein. And when thy herds and thy flocks multiply and your silver and your gold is multiplied and all that you have is multiplied, then your heart be lifted up and you forget the Lord your God, which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. Who led thee through the great and terrible wilderness. I can't do this. Lord, this is so good. <sighs> Look at this. Who led thee in the wilderness? Oh, whoa, 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 where are we at? Verse 15. Who led thee through that great and terrible wilderness wherein were fiery serpents and scorpions and droughts and there was no water? And who brought thee forth water out of the rock of flint? Now, pause. God is trying to show you one of the main reasons how the enemy causes people to turn lukewarm and backslide. They start forgetting what God has done for them. They start forgetting. The better they life get. Look at David. I want to get too deep with this. I'm trying to, you know what I mean? David was so on fire for God when he was rejected by his own dad. His brothers didn't like him. They, they couldn't stand him. He was alone most of the time as a shepherd. Fighting off wild beasts, including lions and bears, oh my, right, to protect the flock. He was faithful, and he loved the Lord. When he played a song, it was actually to Christ. Come on, talk to me. But as David grew and his life went on, you could see his relationship with God slowly Became more and more gradually turned from God. Remember when he was king. And he was on his little silk bed sheets. Watching Netflix. 
You know what I mean? Eating Doritos. Now, hold on. Calm down for y'all Pharisees in the back behind the bushes looking creepy. Calm down. I know there wasn't Netflix back then. I'm just talking plainly for people to see it for what it is. He became lazy. He looked out that window and seen Bathsheba taking a bath. How you going to be in the bath and your name is Bathsheba? And he was so overwhelmed by her beauty, he called her to his chamber, committed adultery with her, and then had the audacity to kill her husband to hide his sin. He changed. His comfortableness, his castle, his kingdom, his golden cups changed him. There's some of you, you were more on fire for the Lord when you didn't have nothing. When you used to take the bus. When you only had three outfits. Now you pushing a Beams. Now you pushing a Lex or a Benz. Now you got plenty of clothes. Now you got jobs or you got businesses or whatever the case be. And you go to church or you attend certain things, but you know you ain't the same. That's sad. That's sad. I really feel for a lot of y'all. There's a lot of y'all that you know you're not on fire like you used to be. And you're like, Lord, I wish I could go back. I wish I could go back to the beginning. I want to I wanna encourage you that he says to return to him. He does. Now time has gone by. Some of you are married. You have children. You got so many responsibilities. Some of y'all, some of y'all have ministry. You're overwhelmed. Ministering to so many people, but you forgot that you need ministry. And sadly, a lot of times, a, a lot of a lot of Christians in the flock, they're too selfish. They don't care about your walk. They just want you to give them. They just want you to bless them, but they don't think about what you need. They don't care about your needs as a leader. That's wrong. Not all, of course, but the majority have that swine spirit. Wow, that's heavy, y'all. It's heavy. I want you to go to Revelation chapter 2. Man, I want to give you a word of encouragement. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that hold the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. Wow. I know your works and thy labor. What do you mean works? I thought there was no work, right? You see how crazy it is? Of course you got to work in this. Of course you got to put in work. Like only, only foolish Christians would come up with a doctrine that says there's no work involved when it comes to the gospel. We're not talking about salvation. Jesus did all that on the cross, but you got to put in work in this thing. Believe that. Let nobody lie to you. But look at this. I know your works and your labor and your patience and how you cannot bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and have found them to be liars and has borne and has patience and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. Nevertheless, listen to this. I have somewhat against thee because you have left your first love. You know what I really love so much about the Lord? It's a heavy day. It's a heavy word. You know, I start off with a smile and a fist bump. And, you know, chef of all chefs, can I get an amen? But, man, the word will hit you. You know? And you got to understand, like, in ministry work, my wife and I have seen so many men and women that are so beautiful. 
is so special fall away and become lukewarm leave the ministry but it, it ain't really about them leaving the ministry it's about them leaving Christ it's so sad but I love about the Lord is that he's so kind like he don't want to just cut straight to the mustard he's saying you know, look, I, I know you labor. I know you've worked. I, I know you have patience. You can't stand them that are evil. But you. See what I mean? Like he's balanced. He gave us a little bit of encouragement that he does acknowledge good things that we do. But he's not going to be fake. He's also going to tell you what he doesn't like about you. He's going to tell you what he's offended with. And I don't think a lot of y'all understand that. You want to try to blind the Lord, which you can't do anyways, but you want to try to blind Jesus with all the nice things you do. You hand out tracts and you, you do this and you post things on Facebook and you got a little this or you do that. But God is like, look, move all that aside. What about that? I see that. And that's a problem. I know all of this is nice, but what about this? Look at how good he is. Listen to what he says. You have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from whence you are fallen and repent and do first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove your candlestick out of his place, except you repent. You see that he's telling you, you can go back to your first love. So no matter how far you've went, sister, brother, he's telling you he wants you to come back. Wow. That's good. That's really good. I want to transition. I'm going to read one more in Jeremiah. And then I want to transition to... Uh, I'm just going to actually use one person as a, as a uh, example in the word of the Lord. One person as an example... That fell away. And how it was actually very hurtful. I want you to go to Jeremiah 5 first though. Go to Jeremiah chapter 5 first. Okay. And uh, read verse 7. How shall I pardon thee for this? Thy children have forsaken me. And sworn by them that are no gods. When I have fed them to the full. Then they committed adultery and assembled themselves by troops in the harlot's houses. They were as fed horses in the morning, every one neighed after his neighbor's wife. Shall I not visit for these things, saith the Lord? And shall not my soul be avenged on such a nation as this? Go you up upon her walls and destroy, but make not a full end. Take away her battlements, for they are not the Lord's. For the house of Israel and the house of Judah have dealt very treacherously against me, saith the Lord. And this is not right. I'm realizing as I'm given this word how much God went through how many times his people have turned their back on him have be, have betrayed him has hurt him and all he wanted was his people to be real with him to be faithful and loyal to him to not take him for granted And although there's many men, there's many people, and although there are some in the Bible that please God, right? Enoch pleased God. Joseph 
was faithful to the Lord. But what if I told you that there was only one person who could really, truly, fully please God, never betray him, never turn on him, never change on him, and that was his son, Jesus Christ. Oh, man. I don't know. Is this hitting you like it's hitting me? Because this is hitting me. Because sometimes it's hard. When people turn on my wife and I. When they go back to the world. But our feelings should not be the main concern. We should be more concerned with how God feels. Because if you think about it, not even just this ministry, but any real ministry. I know there's not a lot of them, but there's other real ministries. If, if somebody walks away from a real ministry, they had to walk away from God first. They may lie to themselves and just be like, no, that ministry expected too much of me. It was too militant. Uh, pastor was too heavy handed He was always trying to Make me feel bad about my life And about I'm never good enough He's always making me acknowledge my sin They can make excuses on why they left But at the end of the day They walked away from God They can go into a lukewarm church And feel like wow this is more like This is more for me I'm more comfortable here But it's not the same because they walked away from the Lord. Think about this logically. If a ministry is filled with God and you can, you can tell God is in this ministry, the word is anointed. The Holy Ghost is evident. There has been signs. There has been gifts. There has been demons casted out. There has been miracles. But yet I'm going to walk out of this ministry. But don't worry. I'm still going to be with the Lord. That, that, come on. That, that's not even logical. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Wow. Wow. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Honestly, I don't even want to do a walk away. Like, I'm so like, it's like I'm feeling, even if it's just a few crumbs, but I'm feeling pain, the pain of God. Man. And before I read this, you know, people email us and... Every Thursday night on the conference line, there's new people that get on and they're just like, you know, Brother Wiley, man, you're so blessed, man. You're so on fire for the Lord. And, you know, I would love to be on fire like you one day. And people that know my wife and I very well and, and believers that have been in this ministry for a long time, I'm talking years. Two, three, four, five, six, even seven, eight years. They know how we are. I I deflect that to Jesus. I give him the glory when people compliment me. My wife does the same thing, but I'll get brothers and sisters that'll be like, man, brother Wally, man, you are on fire, man. I just want to be like that one day. I, I don't necessarily want to be like you. I just want to have that fire that you have. But I just want you guys to know that as much as I love the Lord today, and I thank God that I can say that my wife and I love the Lord and we're not living a secret life of sin. And Y'all, if you knew how I was in the beginning of my walk, if you knew my level of obedience, if you knew my level of zeal, if you knew how long I prayed, if you knew how long I read my Bible, if you knew, and, and the, the truth is, is that 
as I grew and as I got older and God blessed me with my amazing wife and God blessed me with my two amazing sons and God blessed me with this ministry and he blessed my wife and I with so many of y'all and a big responsibility, you know, to return emails and calls and do local ministry and street outreach and all of these things and, and as amazing as it is. I miss my beginning. I do. I miss my first love. And I miss being able to spend time in the Lord without so many responsibilities. And I want you guys to know that we can't make excuses. Sister, brother, you can't make an excuse when you get married and you have children and a lot of y'all have to work hard and work overtime to pay bills and you feel so ashamed because you're like, Lord, I don't spend time with you like I used to. It's not that I'm not spending time with you. It's not that I'm living some type of life of sin, but I'm just not reading as much as I used to. I don't pray as much as I used to because back then I was really, really, I'm talking hours of prayer a day, hours of studying a day. And a lot of y'all feel the way I'm feeling right now. And I'm not ashamed of Christ. I'm not ashamed to cry because I'm not going to edit this out and rob you of a blessing because before honor is humility. And to some men, this is a humiliating moment for them to weep publicly but when tears are sincere, they're put into a bottle and they're saved for God. And there's no way that I could preach a message like this. And not know it's for me too. And maybe not backsliding in Laodicea. But when I read the Lord tell all of us. Look, you do good. You work. You put in the labor. You hate them that are evil. You hate evil. That's that's the Lord telling a lot of y'all. Just not not just me, not just me, but a lot of y'all. He's saying, "Look, my child, I know you do a lot. You you hand out Bibles. You you try to minister to people." You know, you, you try to do things for me and you hate evil. And you hate when people commit evil. You hate all the abomination you see. And I know you love me. But I got something against you. Go back to your first love, brothers and sisters. Go back there. And if you're new in Christ and you haven't experienced your first love yet, that's dangerous. You need to have your honeymoon period with the Lord, per se, right? And a relationship with a man and a woman in the beginning is, is beautiful, right? Like, they can't get enough of each other. They can't, they can talk all night on the phone. Right? They can just they just love each other's presence. They love each other's company. And they love each other. But as they grow in their marriage, and it happens, listen, it happens to the best of marriages and good, healthy marriages. But things just naturally change in time. That's all it is. You know, the husband and wife, they still kiss, they still love each other. There's a little bit of flirting here and there. But it's not like the beginning. It's not like before they had children and they got the minivan and he has to work two jobs and she's this hard working stay home mom and she's tired by the time he gets home and they're exhausted and before they know it, they're having dinner, taking a shower, going to bed, repeat. But it's not that they don't love each other. It's not that he's committing adultery or she's committing adultery. It's none of that. It's just their first love is not the same 10 years later. Does that? Do you see what I'm saying? A lot of y'all already know. But the reality is they can rekindle their fire in their marriage. The husband and wife can sit down together and say, look, it's natural. It's natural that we settle in. We get more used to each other. 
we get occupied with children and ballet practice and soccer practice and this practice and piano practice and you know what I mean? The boss wanted me to stay late and you know, and all these distractions have robbed you and I, honey, of having more intimate time together like we used to when it was just us. But on the same token, we appreciate the children. We appreciate the better job or the business or whatever. We appreciate the responsibilities is is a blessing, but it comes with a sacrifice. But we have to not let our marriage fire go out. We have to figure out ways to spend more time together. You got, I'm going to go in. I'm going to talk to my boss. I'm going to tell him, look, I, I want to be a reliable employee. But my marriage means something to me. My, my, my children mean something to me. And I'm just letting you know, Bob, that I'll work the appropriate hours. But please stop asking me to stay late just because other people don't come in. Or you want me to work on Saturday, but that's a day I want to rest and hang out with my family. I want to take them bowling. I want to go to the park. I want to spend time with my family. You have to confront that boss. You have to confront distractions. And you have to make for your life. A lot of us, we've made sacrifices with God to take care of earthly things and things in the world. Come on, be honest. It's time for you now to sacrifice a lot of distractions for God. And the reason why I use marriage as an analogy and as an example is because we are married to Christ and we will be married to him we are the bride of Christ and there's a lot of things that have come our way and it doesn't mean they're all bad things but there's been too many distractions and we have to go back to our first love we, and when I think about when I think about just being in the presence of the Lord when I think about when I would go into the closet and shut the door and I would start worshiping and I would start singing to him and I would start praying and I would feel him all over me. I would feel the Holy Ghost and I'd be praying in the Holy Ghost and I would come out of that closet and I kid you not, it'd be like three and a half or four hours later. Do you think I got time to be in the closet for four hours now? Married with children, responsibilities, thousands of people are in need of ministry and count on and rely on the word of the Lord from my wife and I that we want to make sure we're in prayer. We want to make sure that we're reading. We want to make sure that we have a word for you from the Lord every week. I'm not in my closet four hours a day like I used to. Does that mean I don't pray? Of course not. Does that mean I'm not, not reading? What do you mean? But it just means that first love stage. That's why a lot of y'all, a lot of y'all that are new in the Lord and you wish you had so many people around you, you wish you, you know, this and that. Why don't you stop complaining about being lonely and all of this stuff for y'all single brothers and sisters? And why don't you take advantage of the time you have now to spend four hours a day in prayer, to spend three hours a day when I tell you. I used to run through notebooks like Forrest Gump through a field. You understand? Let me tell you something. I didn't have money for no concordance. I was young. I got saved young. I got saved young. You see what I'm saying to you? And I would, I would cherish a notepad because when you didn't have money, $3 notebook is still $3. And I would cherish every page that I could fill up. And I'll just, I'll start off in like the gospel. And I would just read. And I would read. And I would read. And if something stood out to me, if something stood out to me that was just, it took me back. It, it made me stumble back and fall by the power. I would stop reading. And I would write that verse. <laughs> word for word. 
And then when I was done writing that verse, I would go back to reading. And I would just keep reading. And before I knew it, I read the entire book of John. And then I'd be like, yo, why is it that I'm totally not trying to finish reading? Like, I feel like I just started. And then I go into the book of Acts. And I, before I knew it, I ran through Matthew. I, excuse me. Before I knew it, I ran through John. I ran through the book of Acts. I ran through Romans. And it's like four in the morning. <laughs> and I got about, you know, 15 sheets filled with verses that stood out to me. And then I would stop reading. It'd be like three and a half hours later. And I'd be like, okay. And the Holy Spirit would say, no, you're not done. Now I want you to go through all the verses you wrote down. And I'm like, really? Lord, it's 4.30 in the morning. No, no, no. Read these. Take another half hour, and I want you to read each one of them seven times a piece. Read this one seven times in a row. Read this one seven times in a row. Read this one seven times in a row. Now, it wasn't always 3.30 in the morning, but that's what God would do. He was training me up so I could be prepared for when I was blessed with a wife and blessed with children and blessed with all of y'all. So I could be able to have word bubble up in me to give to you. So that way when I'm preaching and my notepad now is just a it's a guideline. That's all this is now. Just a guideline to keep me structured. So when I preach, I'm not going off topic. But the word is bubbling up in me. The word is because what I put into me, I'm now able to give to you. But some of you feel terrible because you don't have the time you used to have. You have responsibilities. You know, some of you young brothers and sisters, you don't even you don't even have a job. You know, you're like 17 or 18 or 19 or even 20. And, you know, maybe you still live with your parents and don't feel like, oh, you know, you have to move out of your mom and dad's house to be a man. Listen. Respect your honor your honor your parents, you know, if they don't respect your walk with Christ It don't mean you disrespect them love your parents show the love of Christ in that house Take out the trash don't wait for your mother to ask you to do something if the dishes are there do them That's how you can show your love, but take advantage of that time You don't have to work. You don't have a wife and children if a man don't work you shouldn't eat right but when you're young right and you're at home with your parents, take advantage of that time. Study the word. That should be your job. That should be what you put your work into. I'm going to make a commitment, God. I'm not going to get distracted. And I am so grateful that when I got saved, I didn't. there wasn't these type of phones. This is almost 20 years ago. I gave my life to Jesus Christ. And although they came out with like the Blackberry phone or something like that. And there was internet. It wasn't like now. And I'm so grateful for that. Because I learned to see Christ the old fashioned way. I had to actually. If I needed to know something about speaking in tongues. I wasn't like some of these clowns with YouTube channels. Who think they're teachers but they're not. They just know how to look things up. Write them down. And then regurgitate them to you. Don't let these people fool you. A lot of these so called teachers. All they do is they watch other messages from other people. Regurg they re-spin it. And then they act like they got it in a cave somewhere. But true men and women of God spend time in their word. You understand? And if I didn't know something, I literally had to go through the scriptures and look for verses about it. I had to trust the Lord to show me. Wow. So don't be, you know, for y'all that are able to, don't play with the Lord during your honeymoon stage. During your time of intimacy where you actually can spend four hours in prayer. Some of y'all are like, bruh, four hours? Yeah. Yes. And it went by like that. There were times my wife and I, because it wasn't just me alone. Even when I met my wife and we became married. My fire poured onto her and she became on fire. And then we were both on fire provoking each other to godliness. We would go together in that prayer closet. Yo, oh man. Two hours would go by like 20 minutes. Wouldn't even realize. It was almost like time disappeared in the presence of the Lord. I kid you not. 
two hours in prayer? That was kind of like a common thing. Studying? It wasn't, all right, I'll just, let's see, I'll just read a chapter, oh Lord, that's all I can do today, Lord. Uh, and halfway through the tra chapter, your mind is thinking of other things, and you're like, let me just, uh, you yawn like five times, and you get done with the chapter, and you walk away, because it's a chore now, it became a chore. You're just doing it to please God. But it hurts God. What happened to your love? What happened to your excitement? What happened to you taking time to pray? And what I'm going to stand for all the parents out there, the spouses out there, those that run businesses and have three jobs just to survive. And I know you feel overwhelmed because you're like, man of God, I, I literally don't have three hours to pray in the closet. If I disappear for one hour, I got three little children crying, wondering where mommy is. Brother, I can't do this. I got so many bills. If I don't work 50, 60 hours a week, I'm, we're going to be out on the street. I can't afford this house. When do I have time to pray? Listen to me. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. And if you're honest with yourself, brother and sister, you can make time. You can. You can sacrifice certain things and instead put time into your word. Put time into the Lord. So you're telling me you're never on your phone? Do you know how long the average person in America spends on their phone a day? Whether on WhatsApp or Facebook or YouTube or this or that. It's not minutes, it's hours a day. They just don't realize it because it's 15 minutes here, 20 minutes here. They watch a little compilation funny video here. They talk with someone on Facebook there. But it's, it's literally an average of two to four hours a day. I don't even, whatever the average is, I'll try to find it and put it on the screen. But it's hours a day. You're telling me you can't sacrifice that time and seek the Lord? You're telling me you can't wake up an hour early to pray? An hour longer? You're telling me, you know what I'm saying? You can't sacrifice and be honest and tell Pharaoh you're, you're taking too much of my time with the Lord and stop using your wife or your husband or your children as excuses on why you can't go back to your first love. No, no. Take them back with you to your first love. You got it all wrong. Take your ministry back with you. To your first love. I don't consider my wife. I don't consider my sons. And I don't consider none of y'all a hindrance. It's normal. It's natural. For any relationship. To get settled in. To where they love one another. But the fire just ain't that. It's fiery. It's normal. Ladies remember. When you first was with your husband. You always had to be dolled up. You always had to be dolled up. But as you grew and your love grew, you realize he loves me for me. I don't got to try as hard. I can walk around the house with my sweatpants. Hair is normal. No makeup on. And he loves me. Does that mean you don't love your husband because you don't try as hard? No, it just means there's a settling process to almost everything in life. But Jesus is saying, don't settle in and stay stagnant. Go back to your first love. Find a way and make a way. I'll give you the way if you want it. But if you want to make excuses like Adam and Eve. Oh, so many people make excuses on why they don't do things in life. But there are people that don't care about excuses. They know there's no excuse. I will make a way. There's 24 hours in a day. Are you telling me you can't give God four hours out of 24 hours in a day? What do you do with your time? What can you sacrifice? Write a, write a log of everything you spend time on. And it ain't just stopping with the Lord. Some of you don't spend time with your spouse. You don't spend enough time with your children. And you don't spend enough time with each other. Fellowshipping with each other. You don't spend enough time with brothers and sisters in the body of Christ. Everybody wants to act like they all busy. But some people are actually busy. While other people just want to look busy. Time is more precious than your money. Time is more precious than silver and gold. It don't matter how rich Bates is. 
He cannot buy his way into heaven. And he can't buy back time. Then I make a I make a public confession that I miss my first love. I miss the Lord. I miss him. And he knew, he knew being married, having children, and being responsible as the main little shepherd under him to be responsible for this ministry. He knew it would take away a lot of my time with him. He knew that. The Lord knew that. God is not insecure. He has understanding. So he knows. He might say, my child, you're going to eventually get married. You're eventually going to have children. You're eventually going to have responsibilities and duties. Now, for some, that means ministry duties. For others, they may have to work, uh, you know, uh, two jobs just to take care of their family. You're going to need to do these things. And my child... Take advantage of your time with me now because that stuff will come and you'll still have a relationship with me. You'll still be able to walk in holiness and you'll still breathe and you'll still pray, but it's not going to be like now. Now you got a lot of free time. You can spend four hours in the prayer closet. You can spend four hours reading your word. Take advantage of this child. See, God knows these things, but I'm letting you know. For a long time, I've been telling people, if you think I'm on fire now, if you think my wife is on fire now, you should have met us in the beginning of our walks. <laughs> you want to talk about on fire? <laughs> All right, I got to get going, y'all. This is too much. I want to go worship God in the closet right now. I appreciate this message, man. It brought tears to my eyes just thinking about how far God has taken my wife and I. and Just the amount of time we had to spend in him before so many responsibilities and duties came. You know, didn't Paul say that even about marriage? He said, hey, look, if you're going to get married, know that you're going to have to spend time with the cares of this world. I've, even Paul said... If you get married, you're going to have to stop and take time in the world, doing the duties in the world, he said, right? I'll put the scripture on the screen. You can read it. So, sister, never look at your husband and children. Brother, never look at your wife and children as you're the reason I'm not on fire like I used to. Don't look at, um, you know, all of that. Don't do that. You should get on fire with them. Learn to teach your children about prayer time. That way you don't wait till they go to bed to do your two hours of praying or three hours of praying. Pray with them. Let them know what it's like to pray for 45 minutes because 45 minutes to a child is like three or four hours to you. Don't like wild out and make them pray for four hours. You know what I mean? You got to give them in increments so they can have the understanding. But start praying with your children. Start having Bible study with your wife. And some of you might be like, well, man of God, I'm not a teacher like you. No one's asking you to become a teacher if that's not your calling. But it doesn't mean you can't sit down at your dinner table and spend an hour a night with your wife in the Bible. What is wrong with you, bro? Sister, why don't you pursue fellowship with your husband? Well, maybe your spouse is not saved. And if that's the case... It is what it is. You just pray to get saved and you study. But do not compromise your time with the Lord anymore for nobody. Make it happen. You can still be a parent. You can still be a spouse. You can still work one, two, three jobs and still make time for the Lord. Use wisdom. Listen to the word while you're driving. Listen to sermons while you're driving. On your half hour or hour lunch break, eat while you read. God's not going to get offended with that. Go in the break room and sit down and read your Bible. Okay? When you get home, when you're in bed, instead of doing stuff on your phone, read again with your notebook there. Wake up an hour or two early in the morning. Wake up before the children if you got them. Make time. Make time. Okay? So, I just had to say that, y'all, because, man... I love the Lord, and I remember the hours and hours and hours spending in His presence. 
And I'm so grateful I took advantage of that. Because as I got older and responsibilities came my way, God knows. Listen, brother, God knows you got responsibilities, bro. You got to take care of your wife and children. And for any of you pastors out there, I'm talking real pastors. I'm not talking people that just want to be lifted up as somebody and they're not ordained or called. I'm talking for y'all real pastors out there. And you feel discouraged because you're so distracted, not only at home with your wife and children, but you're overwhelmed with the flock that God has entrusted you with. And you feel like, man, do you not know that God knows you had to do the trade-off? Don't you know that? God knows you had to say, God, I'm not going to be able to spend as much time with you because I got to do all of this. I got to spend time with my family. I spend time with ministry. I got uh, Tuesday night study, men's meeting. Then I got Wednesday night this and a Thursday night that. And Sunday we're preaching and Saturday is family day and Friday's family night. And But if you ask God for wisdom, God will show you how to still maintain an amazing amount of time with him. Okay, so I just wanted to do that for y'all because as far as me and my house, we're going to continue to serve the Lord and we're going to continue to find ways to spend more time with the Lord. And some of you, um, I've had people offended if we don't return their requested phone call back in time because you also got to also be considerate that. My wife and I also need time alone with the Lord. We're not robots. Let's just balance it all out. The same way I wouldn't expect you to respond to 100 emails a day and call 30 people a day. And you know what I'm saying? And that's why we tell people emergencies come first, suicidal people and marriages and shambles. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I, in a way, I feel sorry for a lot of y'all that just want to call in a fellowship and you may not be suicidal. Praise God, your marriage ain't falling apart. And you might feel like, well, man, that's kind of messed up. Like, I never get the, you know what I mean, fellowship because suicidal people are always rising up. You know what I mean? Marriages are always popping out saying, hey, we're falling apart, but we love you. You know what I'm saying? But we also have to spend time with the Lord. Remember Jesus, no matter how big the, wow, wow, wow. No matter how big the crowd was, he would always make time to what? He would always make time to walk away and get alone with the Father. You see? Isn't that amazing? And even for Jesus, he had to readjust his time with his father. Do you know this? Oh, I love this word. When Jesus was growing, he had a relationship with the father from the beginning. Before his ministry, he had much time with the father. And you could imagine all the time he spent in prayer. I mean, could you even imagine? But once ministry began... And he was walking around and casting out devils and healing the sick and multiplying the bread. For those last years of his life, it was very busy for him. There were so many people in need. Everywhere he went, people were climbing trees to get his attention. Blind people were crying out. Women with issues of blood. Wow. Was reaching for him. Ah, oh, Lord. I, I don't know. Like, I'm broken right now. I don't know how to continue preaching to y'all. Women with issues of blood reaching to the hem of his garment. Everywhere he goes, people are running to say, can Jesus just give me five minutes of his time? Even to the point they broke the roof and they're lowering their friend down. So much time. But the father knew. My son, I know you got work to do. I know you got work to do. You got to heal. You got to tell them I'm coming. You got to warn them of my wrath. You got to feed. You got to tell the homeless I ain't forgot about them. Oh, Lord. You got to make the blind see. You got to have dinner with the brother. Who, you got to have dinner with that little guy who climbed the tree. You got to you got to spend time with Nicodemus when he sneaks even in the midnight hour. But my son, 
when you're able to come see me on the mountain. Oh. <laughs> So God the Father, Jesus Christ is saying to you brothers and sisters, as busy as you get, whether you a single, whether you a wife, you a husband, you got children, you got jobs, you know what I mean? Or some of y'all got a ministry and no matter how busy you get, Christ knows you got duties. You got to pray for the lost. You got to tell the homeless God ain't forgot about them. You got to follow after Jesus' footsteps. You got to help the poor. You got to pray for the blind to see. You got to cast out devils. But when you get a chance, when you're able to, my child, come see me on the mountain. Don't forget me. Don't forget me. That's all I'm saying, says the Lord. I... I, you know, it's you know it's so amazing that sometimes when I undermine a message and I think it's it's not gonna be as like big as other messages, God humbles me. I'm gonna be honest. Like I, I, I he told me to do this message and I preached it on Thursday night and so many people were convicted and crying at the end. And you know, I was like, okay, return to the vomit. People are gonna know it's a backsliding message, but I did not I did not assume I, I did not think that this was going to happen. I wasn't expected to be here crying for no half hour. Wow. But I just want to show you something real quick. Um, Demas, if you go to um, Philemon. Let's go to Philemon first before we go to Timothy. Um, Philemon, let's get it. Come on. Philemon chapter 1, verse 24. He says, Marcus... Aristarchus and Demas and Lucas, my fellow laborers. So at this time, Demas was like, yo, he was in it. He was faithful. He was walking with the Lord. He was he was with Paul, right? Um, if you go to Colossians, I want to show you something just real quick. You go to Colossians with me. It's gonna be chapter four, verse um, fourteen. It says Luke. Um, I can't even read, Lord. Just gonna try this again. It says, Luke, the, the beloved physician, and Demas greet you. So at this time, Demas is rolling with Paul, you know what I'm saying? He's in the fight with him. But I want you to go now to 2 Timothy. 2 Timothy. I want you to see this. Chapter um, 4 verse 10. Look at what it says. It says, For Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Cretans, to Galatia, Titus, unto Damasia. So Demas forsook and walked away from Paul. But in reality, because, you know, Paul is so selfless, what hurt Paul the most is that he walked away from the Lord. Although it hurt Paul that Demas walked away from him, Demas walked away from the Lord. And real ministries have people that walk away from them. And you can't be one of these people that just because other people walk away from a real ministry, you start questioning that ministry. And I got a message coming out right after this. Very heavy message. I might even preach it tonight if I'm able to. Just back to back. And it's called, um, Will You Go Also? That's the name of it. Please watch that. Will You Go Also? But I just need you to see that. Paul was hurt here. You could tell he wasn't writing that letter with vengefulness on his heart. He was hurt that Demas would walk away because he grew to love Demas. And he knew that Demas forsook God and that there must have been a gradual turning in Demas that he was hiding. He was slowly changing. He was becoming overworked and worn out. Whatever was going on in him. He was lacking and drying up inside and he didn't tell anybody. And the problem with a lot of you brothers and sisters is you're so worried about your image. 
You, you care so much about what people think of you as a Christian that you will never tell anyone that you're slipping inside. You'll never tell anyone that you don't have the same fire. You want to put on a show and know everything's great. Hallelujah. And do the yelling of the hallelujahs. But deep, sound, deep down inside you are changing. Demas walked away. He walked away. You don't think God don't love Demas? You think Paul didn't love Demas? Demas was rolling with Paul. My wife and I, man, if it wasn't for the Lord's healing, my wife and I have been wounded by people. People that we literally grew to love. Even if they weren't really our type of person in the beginning when we met them. You know what I mean? You know, you have chemistry. Some people you love being around and some you grow to love being around. And to watch them grow and then all of a sudden they start changing. Either they met the wrong people who started to poison them. And then poison them against doctrine and then poison them against us. and Or they fell back into addiction. and They, they didn't want to tell. They, they were too ashamed to just come out and say, look, I went back to drinking, smoking. Look, I'm this or that. Or, and they just walk away. Do you know what that does to leadership? I'm not talking about fake leadership that only cares about money. I'm talking about real shepherds that actually love every single one of you. We love every single one of you. We do not take for granted any time we have physical conferences, 200 people, 300 people. When we come together, we are so grateful to see every single one of your faces. It would hurt to see any of you walk away from Christ. And walk away from this ministry. It hurts. But at the same time. We got to guard our heart. Right? Luke 15. I just want to read this real quick. Alright? Luke 15. Well. You can. I'm, I'm going to let you read it. Because everybody knows about the prodigal son. Okay? But. I'm going to paraphrase it just to save time because honestly, like I said, I thought this was going to be a simple message. Hour and 20 minutes, I'm done. I don't even know how long it's been. Okay, I appreciate you staying with me at the table. But the prodigal son is so amazing because, you know, he walked away from his father with his inheritance. He had selfishness. He had greed. It was about him. A lot of Christians right now, a lot of you struggle with that right now. It's truly about you. A lot of YouTubers that go out with the video camera and this and that, you can tell it's about them. And they, they tell you it's not. And they act like it's not, but their fruit shows otherwise. But this young brother, that he went out. He spent all of his money. He forgot about his house at back home. He forgot about his dad. He forgot about his father. He was blinded by the lights. And mad people wanted to be his friend. But when he ran out of everything, all those people walked away. They weren't real friends. And we've had people that have left this ministry and a year later come back broken, lost everything, and, and say, I was wrong. I'm sorry I walked away, and I'm, I'm more sorry that I walked away from Christ. I, I pretended I didn't. I joined another ministry where I was more comfortable, where there was more stuff. It was bigger. It was more popular. You know what I mean? The pastor laughed all the time. He never said anything convicting. But deep down, I was crying out for a real ministry that would keep me in line. Because that's, that. I knew this ministry loves me enough that they want, you want me to get to heaven. These are documented emails and brothers that would testify, sisters that will testify to what I'm saying happened to them. That they walked out of this ministry and came back realizing, like, listen... This brother ended up eating with the pigs. And if you haven't seen that old message called the spirit of the swine, you need to watch that. Look for it on our YouTube channel. But at that moment, the man realized he was eating with the swine because that's where God wanted him to be. God wanted him to realize that's what he became. He became like a swine. You see, pigs, they only cry when they need something. They, meh, meh. they cry when they're hungry. But as soon as their master hears them and comes over with food, they forget they master. They don't want to have nothing to do with they master when their belly is full. And just like we read in Deuteronomy, and just like we read in other scriptures, 
your increase and you think your physical blessings have made you blessed you might be able to travel you might have a nice car you might have a nice job or even a business or things are going well for you but how is it going in the spirit are you honestly really on fire for God or is that a sacrifice you have made where you put God in a back burner to take care of everything else in your life when it should be the opposite way and don't you know that when you put God first, he'll add everything unto you. But the prodigal son at that moment realized how far he fell. And when he went back to his father, the Bible says his father seeing him afar off waited for him. The father seeing his son from afar off from the balcony. And a lot of scholars and pastors and astute men who went to Bible seminary, they don't catch that. That his father was looking for him from afar off. And a lot of you brothers and sisters, you backslid. You're not the same Christian as you used to be. But your father, Christ has been looking for you. While you wasn't looking for him. Every morning, he goes to that heavenly balcony. And he looks off into the distance and says, is my daughter coming home today? Is my son coming back today? And as the sun goes down, he, he goes back into his 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 place of his dwelling place. The next morning, when the sun is rising up, he looks again. He faithfully has been watching for you day and night just to see you from the distance, that little silhouette, get closer and closer. That means the prodigal son's father, every day without fail, was looking for him. Don't you know that the Lord stands at his balcony and he watches for you to return back to him? Wow. Wow. You can read Romans 12 on your own time. Uh, all right, we'll read it just real quick. Just trying to like balance it. I... I've given you enough scriptures on, on, you know, what backsliding is and, you know what I'm saying? But I want to get to the ending so we can get this prayer in. Amen. But Romans 12, 2, it says, be not conformed to the world, but be you transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove that what is good and acceptable and perfect in the perfect will of God. So the world will slowly try to change you. Sometimes the devil will send people into your life and either they're straight up worldly or they're religious people that have worldly tendencies. And the most dangerous people are religious Christians who grew up in the church and they they were they learned how to become worldly Christians to the point where they didn't think it was a problem. You notice that you notice that men and women that came off of drugs and alcoholism and street life and all and they gave their life to the Lord. At later on in life, maybe at 19, 20, 25, and 30 or whatever, they see lukewarm from a mile away because they weren't raised in lukewarmness. So it's it's bad to them. They're like, yo, this is what's wrong with this church? Like, all y'all are worldly. Y'all do the same dances as the world. Y'all watch mad worldly shows. You do stupid Fortnite dances together. You have all this worldliness. And you don't even see it because they're checking their own temperature. And when somebody from outside comes in, you know what happens to that man or a woman? They get ostracized. They get they get put out. They talk about them behind their back. Like, who does she think she is? Try to tell all of us. And the crowd will be comfortable with the crowd. Let me say that again. The crowd is always comfortable with the crowd. That's why people will walk away from a real ministry and go into another ministry where they're comfortable in the crowd. Wow. Jeremiah 5. Come on, let's wrap this up. Jeremiah 5. Look at what it says in verse 7. How shall I pardon thee for this? Thy chill. This. Wow. So. We're going to talk about correction, repenting, and returning, okay? And then we're going to bring it all together. I'm Maybe just do one verse per subject. Is that fair enough to save time? Go to Hebrews 12. 
about correction. Just real quick with me now. Come on. Hebrews 12. This is verse 6 going down. In Jesus' name. For whom the Lord love, he chastens, and scourges every son whom he receives. And if you endure chastening, God deal with you as with sons. That means you too, ladies. Remember, in the spirit, we're all sons of God, right? He says, for what son is he whom the father chasten not? But if you be without chastisement, wherever are you partakers, then are you bastards and not sons, Right? And you can continue to read, but you get the point. So that correction you're feeling right now and that conviction, the Holy Spirit convicts. And see, I'm not fake. There's no way I could preach this message. And then when I read the verse about going back to my first love, it's impossible. I couldn't do it. I couldn't be, I couldn't sleep tonight knowing that I hid my tears because I know as much as I love the Lord, my wife loves the Lord. As much as we are on fire, it's not like our first love. Just being real with you. And we love the Lord. And right now, we want to make sure we manage time for our children with one another and with all of you. We love your emails. We love the y'all text messages to the ministry phone. The letters you write us. The comments you leave in the YouTube section. Others that work hard and help where they can. And we got so many others that want to help with the load. They want to help. You know, Moses had 70 men. And don't think I'm comparing myself to that mighty man, Moses. He's far greater than me. But it doesn't mean that I don't need help. Because we want to manage time so my wife and I can have more time in the presence of God. Because if we have more time in the presence of God, you wait. You're going to get greater revelations than you get now. When we get together for conferences, way more deliverance is going to happen. Way more miracles are going to happen because we're going off to the mountain. You see, it's all about balancing out. And I just thank God because, you know, there's, to me, there's two different types of... There's two different types mainly of backsliding, right? You have Christians that backslid and went back to physical sin, smoking, drinking, fornicating, committing adultery, just cursing, and oh, it's terrible. That's like the, the worst, like that's just dangerous, backsliding. But the one that's more deceptive though and goes under the radar is the Christians who they're not drinking, they're not smoking, they don't commit adultery, they're not fornicating, they don't watch secret pornea at night, they're not cursing, but they slowly, they're, they're not praying as much as they used to. Their reading has slowed down. They don't fast as often as they used to. And that backsliding is another level of backsliding. Do you understand? And a lot of you are victim of that one. So, who the Lord loves, he corrects. Amen. Repenting. Jeremiah 15. Just real quick. But the big one. We're going to read two for this one. Because the one that I love, I can't skip over. It's so powerful. But Jeremiah 15. I want you to see verse 19 going down. It said, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, if you return... Then will I bring thee again, and thou shalt stand before me. And if you take forth the precious from the vial, and you shall be as my mouth, let them return unto thee, but return not thou unto them. Wow. You see what the Lord is saying. And I speak this on all people around the world, and of course I speak this to the United States of America. For as many of you can repent and weep and cry out, whether you're backsliding in that nasty way, you're sinning, you're fornicating, you're pornea, smoking, drinking, worldliness, you got worldly friends, you better watch um, spiritual amputation, you better watch that message, right? You need to repent. And for the other half of you that are, you're backsliding, maybe not that way, but you're not on fire like you used to. Remember, Jesus complimented you. He said, you're doing the work. You even hate evil. But I have ought against you. Because you have walked away from your first love. Your fire is not the same. You better repent. And you better turn back to me, says the Lord. Wow. Wow. 
All right, I want you to go now to Psalms 51. Now, this is huge. We're not going to more than likely read the whole thing. But I want you to see how, how magnificent this man loves the Lord and how humbling he was before him. And you could imagine when this, when this came to David... He says, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. You know, and, and all right, yep, my eyes are watering again. But you got to understand that I don't do this every, I, it has, there's a certain season where I just can't help it. And I'm thinking about David. I'm thinking about where was he when this happened? When he wrote this Psalms, was this when the prophet came to him and said, thou art the man? Remember that? Remember after he done impregnated Bathsheba, he killed Uriah. And the prophet came to David and said, O king, I got to talk to you. There is a man. There is a man, I'm paraphrasing it. He said, there is a man who has everything he could ever ask for. And he's seen a lamb that was owned by another man. And he wanted that lamb so bad that he killed the owner of that lamb. Just to take, all that man had was one lamb. And the other man had everything. But he wanted that one lamb and he, he had that man killed and he took his lamb. He said, David, what should be done to this man? David was so furiated and enraged. He said, man, that man should be killed. He said, thou art the man. You want to talk about the most terrifying day of David's life. More terrifying than anything else. Goliath had nothing. Goliath had nothing on that day. The lion and the bear. Running through thousands of Philistines. Had nothing on that dreadful and terrifying day. When the prophet. Filled with David's best friend. So disappointed. On how David changed. On how his life changed. When things were going well for him. And he became greedy. He forgot what a shepherd was like. And he forgot what it, what it meant to be a faithful shepherd. He forgot what it meant to be loving towards even the littlest of the lambs. So the prophet had to come in and tell David something that would bring him back to his first love. Wow. So he used the lamb as an example. To talk about how David killed Uriah and took his one possession. Took his wife from him. What have you killed to desire something? Maybe not a human being, but what have you killed in your life that had a connection with Christ to get something else? Have you killed your fellowship with God to get a better job? Have you killed your study time with the Lord to be more successful online? What have you killed to gain something that wasn't really yours? Did you forget all the times the Lord was alone with you like he was with David on that hill? Playing a harp? No, David didn't have a fan base. David didn't have concerts to go to. David wasn't famous and well known. But God was pleased and God loved and the angels, he was famous in heaven. And some of you are musicians. And some of you got popular online. And some of you are known. Because of maybe your gifts. Maybe you sing good. And now you're famous to the world. But heaven doesn't know you anymore. First John. No, no, no. Let's finish this. Uh, 
verse 2, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and only thee have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, and thou that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judge. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. You know, I often wonder, was Paul's revelation of Psalms 51 in Romans 7, when he kept talking about how wretched man he was, and when he tried to do right, he would do wrong, and when he didn't want to do wrong, he did it. He said, I know it's no longer me, but sin that dwells in me. I kind of see like Psalms 51 to David was like Romans 7 to Paul. You see what I'm saying? Not that Paul like killed a man's why uh, killed a man and took his wife, but you get the analogy. You see why I, I caught that in the spirit. But he says, "Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts; in the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow." And you often like think about it how. At this point, there was no shed blood of Jesus at his time for him to call on. He was just hoping that, Lord, you would wash me. Lord, forgive me now. And even if it's after I go to the grave, but at some point, son of God, clean me white as snow. And that that promise was fulfilled. And David made it into heaven. And Jesus Christ shed his blood for everyone. Listen to me. Whosoever willeth. That means past, present, and future. All people. He died for all. And whoever was living in the present and in the future have to give their life to Christ. But anyone before Christ died and rose from the dead prior, you know, David and Abraham and Adam and Eve and Samson, uh, you know, Esther and Ruth, Naomi, and a lot of, most of them, were put into Abraham's bosom to wait for Jesus to come down and set them free. And they were washed by his blood. Did you know that? Okay, we're not going to get into that. But look at this. It says, Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Listen to what he says now. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Do you see this? Now, I'm going to stop there, but you obviously read the rest on your own time. But all he cared about, he didn't say, don't take the kingdom from me. He didn't say, don't take all my wives from me. He didn't say, don't take my wealth from me. He said, don't take your Holy Spirit from me. You see how important that is. Do you see the lesson in that? So now we're talking about returning to the Lord, right? I want you to read Proverbs 16 on your own time. I want you to read Hosea 14, 4 on your own time. I mean, all through Jeremiah, Jeremiah 9, 26, no, 9, Jeremiah 9, 62, Jeremiah 24, 7, Jeremiah 3, 22. I want us to go to Jeremiah though. Just real quick, Jeremiah 3, 22. Now, I appreciate y'all sticking around, okay? It says, return you backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. Behold, we come unto thee, for thou art the Lord our God. He's saying, if you would just come back, I will heal you. You see, the devil wants to lie to a lot of you and make it seem like you done gone too far, you done sinned too much, and God don't have time for you. You better cast down those lies and go running back to Jesus. You better go running back to Jesus like the prodigal son. Whether you man or woman, go running back to him. He wants to heal you. And if you've never seen the project parable called running from the water, you need to watch that. Or it's running from the shower or running from the water. You need to watch that. Okay? But you need to run to him. You need to go back to him. Right? I want you to go now, right now, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, but we're going to go to Isaiah 57. Okay, Isaiah 57. 
Isaiah 57. I want you to see this now in verse 17. For I will not contend forever, neither will I be always wroth. For the spirit should fail before me in the souls which I have made. For the iniquity of his covetousness was I wroth, and I and smote him. I hid me in wrath, and he went on frowardly in the way of his heart. I have seen his ways, and will heal him. I will lead him also, and restore comforts unto him, and to his mourners. You see this? Listen to this. I create the fruit of the lips. Peace, peace to him that is far off and to him that is near. Saith the Lord, I will heal him. In the spirit, what that means is some that are starting to backslide now. And even though they're falling away from the Lord, they're still close to him. He's still able to convict them. He's still able to talk to them in their dream. He's still able to tell them, why are you watching that movie? You were never like that, my child. Why are you listening to that? Why are you hang why are you changing around certain people on your job? Why are you changing on me? They're not too far from him. Listen to what it says now. We just read it now. It says, and and uh I'm gonna read it again. 19. I create the fruit of the lips, peace, peace to him that is afar off, and to him that is near. So those that are near are people that are slipping away, but he can still convict them. But he's also calling you that are afar off. Some of you have been backsliding for a long time to the point where you're too ashamed to go back to God. He's telling you, you that are afar off, come back to me. I don't care if it's been years, come back to me. Remember, the first shall be last and the last shall be first. Some of you he's snatching out of the fire. Run to him. I plead with your soul. I'm telling you, go back to him while you can. If you don't go back to him now... You're going to take the mark of the beast. Go back to him. Put those wicked things down. Go off to the mountain. Get away from the crowds. Take time to get alone with the Lord. Go back to him. In Jesus Christ's name. Now, we're going to bring it all together now. We're going to bring it all together with a few more scriptures. And then we're going to pray. I want you to go to Proverbs 26. I want you to see this now. It says here in verse 11. As a dog returns to his vomit, so does a fool return to his folly. You see this? As a fool. Listen to this. As a dog returns to his vomit, so does a fool return to his folly. <laughs> now imagine this. Okay, go to 2 Peter. Just let's go there first because we got to confirm it with the New Testament. Go to 2 Peter. Okay, we're going to go to chapter 2, verse 22. Look at what it says. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb. No, nah, we can't do it yet. We got to read a little bit more. Wow. Okay, do you make a promise? Can you please read the whole chapter 2, please? Okay, because you got to read... I mean, at least from verse 11 going down, he talks about people that are just falling into sin and they're like wells without water. Make that commitment, okay, that you're going to read it. But when you get to verse 22, that's where I'm at. Listen to what it says. It says, but it's happened unto them according to the true proverb. Now he's referring to the proverb we just read, right? The dog is returned to his own vomit again, and the soul that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. So this dog, obviously he's talking about a pig too, but let's just stick to the dog now. He's saying, as the dog returns to his vomit, so does a fool go back to his evil ways. And I want you to take a moment now and think, how do you think God feels when he has to watch you do that? Have you ever seen how disgusting it is when a dog vomits and then eats it back up? Now, I told you, remember I told you I was going to play a video, a small compilation. And don't try to get out of the spirit and be like, why are you being gross, Brother Wally? You don't have to do that. No, I had to. Because if God has no choice but to watch you eat your own vomit, I want you to actually watch a small compilation of how disgusting it is for dogs to eat their own vomit. Don't fast forward it. You need to watch it 
So that way, you, before you go back to your vomit, you're going to realize what you're making God watch. Okay? So please watch this. If I had to watch it, are you better than me? Ain't we all in this together? Check this out. I'm going to be right back. Lord, when I try to do what's right And the times I seem to fall oh, I keep When I'm on my knees and I'm feeling weak And I cry, you hear my cries Lord, I want to walk with you Tell me why am I so ashamed All these distractions I'm praying and reading Like I used to, something changed As disgusting as that was, it wasn't to be funny, it wasn't to joke or be gross. No, I needed you to see what God deals with, what God goes through. When he, he, he causes things to come up out of so many of you. He's the one who delivered you, sister, brother. He got you off the cigarettes, he got you off the bottle. He delivered you from pornea, fornication. But you vomited it all up. It splattered all over the floor. Remember, a day with the Lord is like a thousand years. So a year later is like a minute to him. And God had to watch you eat the vomit of all that he took out of you. He watched you go back to those demon infested things and eat it back up like vomit. Do you see now why I had you watch that video? Because I needed you to see how what God goes through. It's not fun, was it? Was it fun watching that? How you think the Lord feels when he got to watch you go back into backsliding? Jonah chapter 2. Let's, let's bring all this together. Let's bring it all together. Here's the nugget. You know, God is so good. He's very kind. He gives revelations pretty much every message. We don't go without some kind of phenomenal revelation. He's, that, he's just very merciful to us, isn't he? But I want you to see this now. We're going to go now to chapter 2. Check this out. This is going to be verse 9 going down. Who can tell? Excuse me. Chapter 2, verse 9 going down. But I will sacrifice unto thee with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that that that, that I have vowed. I will pay that that I have vowed. Salvation is of the Lord. Now listen to this. And the Lord spoke unto the fish, and it what? Vomited out Jonah upon the dry land. Now you got to remember, at this moment, Jonah finally died. In other words, he was utterly broken. There's a deeper mystery to that. We're not going to get into that. But he finally realized he had to humble himself and do the will of God and, and to live for Christ and to be dead to self. And at that moment, God said, okay, Jonah, you're going to live for me now. Stop running from my will. Stop backsliding. Stop turning away from me. You get it? You think it's a coincidence that the fish vomited Jonah out? Didn't we just read, as a dog returns to his vomit, so does a fool go back to his foolishness? God was letting us know that's the nugget, right? That we 
vomit out the ways of the world. We vomit out those addictions. We, even in literal deliverance prayers, a lot of people vomit during our conferences we have and things like that. Especially when we were doing the, the, uh, the one at the campground, three days. Vomit all over the place. Had to wipe it up, foam and... But it's, it, there's a spiritual vomit where people vomit up their addictions. They vomit up that bitterness they had towards their ex. They vomit up that unforgiveness towards their molesting uncle. They vomit up pride. They vomit up pornea. They vomit up, right? And God is saying, children, know that when Jonah finally realized... He was backsliding and running from me. And he humbled himself and repented and he died to self. It was at that moment I made that thing vomit him up. Some of you have been devout. Some of you have been devoured by the adversary that, wow, that roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Your whole life has been in shambles. You know, your connection with God ain't the same. Your prayer life ain't the same. Your reading ain't the same. Your marriage ain't the same. Cry out from the belly of that adversary and watch God command him to vomit you out. Wow. Satan can't hold you. All you got to do is cry out to the son of God. There's no deep, deep place God won't hear you. There's no far place God's right hand can't reach you. I don't care how far you think you have fallen. As long as you got that conviction, it's a sign that the Holy Spirit is calling you to cry to the Son of God. And God will make that addiction vomit you out. God will make that porno vomit you out. God will make that thing vomit you out to dry land. Wow. One more. One more before we pray. Revelation. Chapter 3. Wow. It's like I don't want to do the walk away today. But I don't know y'all. Revelation chapter 3. I want you to see this now. Verse 13 going down. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And unto the angel of the church of Laodicea and write, These things saith the Amen. The faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. And that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would rather you be cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. And you have to realize in that language, in the Greek, there's even translations that say, I will vomit you out of my mouth. I will spew you. I will spit you. Right? What if I told you at this moment, what Jesus is saying for all of you that are refusing to get that out of you. And you keep eating up the vomit that God has taken out of you. And because you are what you eat and you have become the vomit you have been consuming. God himself will vomit you out. Because that's what he's calling you. Some of you want to play in the vomit. You want to roll around in the vomit like a pig. You want to eat the very same things. He done delivered you from that addiction. You go back. He delivered that person you were fornicating with. You text them. Come on. You keep playing with that vomit. And out of his mouth you will be vomited out. And he goes on to say as we wrap up to get ready to pray. As we get ready to pray. Wow. <sighs> because you say I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor, blind and naked. 
Do you think it's a coincidence that this is Genesis? Uh, this is, do you think it's coincidence? This is Revelation chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve had everything, but in one day they became wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. They, they realized they were naked. They were blinded to what happened. They became poor. They were kicked out of the garden. This is the same parallel. Look at this. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich in white raiment. That thou mayest be clothed and have that that shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint your eyes with eyes soft that thou mayest see as many as I love I rebuke and chasten be zealous therefore and repent behold I stand at the door and I knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door I will come into him and will have dinner with him and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and is set down with my father in his throne. He that had an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Even in the midst of his sharp rebuke, he's still hopeful, asking you to repent, telling you, look, you don't have to be lukewarm. You don't have to be cold. Have you ever drank lukewarm coffee? It's disgusting. That's how real he is. He's like, look, if you want to go to the world, if you want to just do that then. If you want to be on fire for me, that's what I would rather. Come on, do that. But you're not going to be both. You're not going to be both, okay? You're not going to go to Sunday, but Saturday you was getting it in for Satan. But on Sunday, you want to shun that eye and roll on the floor. You're going to follow me or you're going to follow the world. You cannot serve two masters. So what is it right now, sister and brother? Are you ready to pray with me? Are you ready to commit yourself? And I'm asking God for strength. So I don't weep through this prayer with you. I want to be strong for you. Let's do it together. I want you to pray this prayer with me. I want you to say, Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Forgive me, Lord Jesus Christ. Slowly I've been changing and backsliding. And just like a frog in the boiling water, I didn't realize it, Lord. And just how I can't check my own temperature, Lord, you spoke to me in this message and checked my temperature. Lord, I am so sorry, Lord Jesus Christ. Please forgive me, Lord, for my backsliding. Now for some of you, your backsliding is, is more than just not praying and reading like you're supposed to. Some of y'all went back to that bottle. You went back to that, that smoke, that, that, that fornicating partner, that pride, that arrogance, or whatever it is. You better renounce that right now. Say it with me. Say, Lord, I repent and I renounce all the vomit that I've eaten back up. I am so sorry, Lord, that I have made you watch me eat vomit up like a dog does. And it's so disgusting, Lord. And for some of you, you may not be deep in the sinful life, but your iniquities are hidden because you don't read like you used to. You don't pray like you used to. You've allowed time to consume you. You've not been balancing your time. You have not been going off to the mountain with the Father. You need to pray this along with all you others. Because if you're on the bottle, if you're smoking a fornicane, you most certainly ain't reading and praying like you should. Say, Lord Jesus Christ, forgive me. For being distracted. I don't want to make excuses anymore. Lord Jesus. I want to go back to my first love. I don't want to blame anyone. I don't want to blame my spouse. Children. Ministry. Jobs. I can make time. You said if I ask you for wisdom. You will give me more wisdom. Lord Jesus. I'm asking you for wisdom. That I can have more time. In the midst of my busy life. To spend more time with you in the mountain. Lord Jesus Christ, deliver me from the curse and the spirit of Laodicean. Deliver me from the curse of being lukewarm. I command that spirit to come out of me now in Jesus Christ's name. Lord, you said in Hebrews 12 that you want to correct those you love. And I receive my correction right now. 
Lord, you said in Jeremiah 15 and Psalms 51 that we must repent to you. Well, I'm repenting to you right now, Lord Jesus. And like David said in Psalms 51, to you and against you have I sinned, Lord. And I acknowledge, Lord, I was born in iniquity, shaped in sin. But Lord Jesus, you died for me. You rose from the dead and you shed your blood. That thing that David cried out for, that hope that he had that one day he would be washed. I know now that it is by the blood of Jesus Christ that I can be washed and redeemed right now. Lord, I truly repent. I want to turn away from those sins. I want to turn away from making excuses and not having enough time in you, in your Holy Ghost, in your word, and in prayer. I repent, Lord Jesus. You said that I should return to you and you would heal me. Well, I'm returning to you now, Lord Jesus, like the prodigal child, the prodigal son. And I know you've been on the balcony waiting for me. And I love you so much. And you've loved me more way before I even knew about loving you. When I was yet a sinner, you loved me so much you died for me. And Lord, I'm coming back. I've realized I've been eating with the pigs. I've been in the midst of the world, rolling in the mud of sin. And I reject and rebuke the spirit of the swine. And Lord, I'm coming back. I'm running to the mercy seat. I'm coming back to you, Father. Lord Jesus. I'm examining myself. I want to be in the faith. I don't want to be deceived and confuse a gift or an anointing with your presence, oh God. Please, Lord. I don't want you to remove your Holy Spirit from me. I make a willful commitment to spend more time with you alone and personal, no matter how busy my life is. Lord, I'm sorry. I take you from the back and I put you to the front. Now, if you're married and if you have children, I want you to say, Lord, I repent. I want to spend more time with you with my spouse. More time with you with my children. I want them to know what it's like to spend time in your presence. And to know what it's like to go off to the mountain. Maybe not a literal mountain. Maybe not a literal mountain, but a spiritual mountain. Help me to fellowship with my family. Because ministry begins in my home. Lord, I want to increase my fellowship with my brothers and sisters. I want to study the word with them more. I want to pray together more. I don't want to forsake the assembling regardless of what these people tell me during this so-called pandemic. I want to come together, unite in you, Jesus Christ. Lord, don't let the spirit of demons take me. I don't want to forsake Any leader like he did, Paul. I don't want to walk away from your servants that labor for me for your glory. They serve me. They pray for me. They teach me. If I've been changing, Lord, even if I don't see it, take it out of me, Lord Jesus. I command the world spirit to come out of me. The love of the world come out of me. Laziness, excuses come out of me in Jesus' name. Pride. Loosen now in Jesus' name. Brothers and sisters, you better be praying. As a little shepherd, I'm leading you to pray. Lord Jesus Christ, right now, I declare a new relationship with you. I declare a fresh start, Lord. You said you want to heal me. You look forward to me coming back to you. You want to remember my sins no more. You want to wash them away in your blood. So right now I receive your forgiveness. I receive your mercy right now, Jesus. I renounce eating vomit. And anything I ate up that you took out of me. Or anything that needs to be vomited out. I command you to come out of me now in Jesus' name. Come on, brothers and sisters, all vomit, anything of the world, anything that's vomit to God, I command you to come out and stay out. I will not eat vomit to the point God will vomit me out. 
You will not cause me to lose my salvation in my walk with Christ. I come against that thing. Whatever sin that is. Whatever temptation could cause me to go back to vomit. I break you in Jesus Christ's mighty name. The spirit of a dog. You are not allowed in me. Get out. Get away. In Jesus Christ's name. Hallelujah. Say, Lord Jesus, I receive my forgiveness. I receive your mercy and grace. Fill me with the fear of God and fill me with your word. Cause me to study and have a joy to study. I don't want it to be a chore. I don't want it to be I just read to please you. Stir me up to enjoy reading where I can't get enough of it. Where I choose the word over scrolling through my phone. Where I choose the word over wasting my time on other things. And cause me to be in your presence to the point where I don't even know time has passed it by in the prayer closet. Renew me, Lord God, with a relationship with you. Light me on fire. I renounce coldness of heart and lukewarmness. And I declare that the Holy Ghost is with me. The fire of God is consuming me. And the wind is keeping it burning. In the name of Jesus Christ, the blood of the Lamb has washed me right now. I have been made righteous and holy by the blood of Jesus Christ. Through the blood of the Lamb, I am forgiven and justified. I have peace with God the Father. Through His blood, He has saved me. And by my actions and living righteous, He shall keep and preserve me. Cause me to hate what you hate, Lord, and love what you love. In the name of Jesus Christ. And if there's anyone in my life that is causing me to sin, remove them, God, or change them to worship you. Lord Jesus, I praise you right now and I give you the glory for healing me and delivering me and convicting me and causing me to repent and forgiving me. You have forgiven me. My heart will not deceive me. I will not allow the enemy to lie to me as if you don't love me and you haven't forgiven me. You have forgiven me. And I receive your forgiveness. I will not dwell in the wilderness of shame. I will go forward and sin no more. I will fight sin like the plague. You will help me, Lord. Because I can't do it without you. And your letter says, if I happen to make a mistake, Jesus, you will be my advocate with the Father. Because I'm no longer practicing sin. I'm living righteous, trying not to sin. Change my nature, Lord Jesus Christ. Make me holy right now with your righteousness. Give me your mind. Give me your obedience. Cause me to seek your face. Don't let anything put out my fire ever again. Cause my home to be on fire in the spirit for you. Save relatives, whether spouse or children. Save everybody around me, Lord God. Light them on fire, Lord God. You said my whole household shall be saved. I want to hold that promise and hope that it comes to pass. In Jesus Christ's name, may I be a light in dark places. May I be a leader and not a follower. In Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. Hold on. God wants me to do this. I want to pray for you. Father God, right now for all of those that have sincerely repented, they have poured out unto you, O God. Lord Jesus Christ, right now, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I may not be physically with them, but you are. You're with them right now. And you said where two or more are gathered in your name, you would be in their presence, O God. Right now, by the sound of Jesus Christ in my voice, I command those strongholds, every power of darkness, anything that can come out without prayer and fasting. Brothers and sisters, if you got to fast, you better make sure you fast. But I'm going to do this. I normally don't do this a lot over this video. But I feel the Lord speaking to me. In the name of Jesus Christ, to those that will commit to fast and those that will commit to fight sin, I'm praying for you. Those that have repented and got washed into the blood, I'm praying for you right now. Here is my prayer. In the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, as a servant of the Most High God that has been washed by the blood of the Lamb and redeemed, by the sound of Jesus Christ in my voice and by the power of the Holy Ghost, I command every demon, stronghold, 
lukewarm spirit, the Laodicean spirit, the curse of Demas, all vomit. Come out in Jesus Christ's name. Loosen that child of God. Loosen her in him. I break the chains right now. Break in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Addictions, depression, wrath and anger, unforgiveness and bitterness. The love of the world, break and come out in the name of Jesus Christ. The addictions of pornea, lust, break and come out in Jesus Christ's name. I strike at the kingdom of Satan. You are illegal and you know it. I command you by the power of the Holy Ghost and by the sound of Jesus Christ in my voice, come out of them now. Loosen, come out. In the name of Jesus Christ. Father fill them with the kingdom of heaven. Fill them with the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Fill them with obedience. And fill them with the word of God. And the fear of the Lord. Seal them up and keep them from falling. In Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Saints of God. I'm not even going to be like. This video needs to go viral. Those that are meant to watch this video will watch it. Those that don't watch it, I feel really sorry for them. Saints of God, I don't know, I'm, I'm done, I gotta go. We love y'all so much, we appreciate your prayers, your support, and above everything, picking up your cross and following after Christ along our side. As we fight the powers of darkness and bring the gospel to the four ends of the earth, we love y'all so much. Thank you for staying with me at the dinner table. Until next time, pray for us as we pray for you. Your prayers are so important right now. And in Jesus Christ's name, this word has blessed me tremendously. We love y'all. Bless.